Hi, good morning. And it's, it's delightful to see all of you here today. And I, I want to thank you for attending. Each fall, we have the Carl Henry Nacht Memorial Lecture. And it's a particular moment for us to celebrate Dr. Nacht and all of his contributions to our community. Uh, and also just to reflect upon the kind of person that he was and the kind of physician that he was. And I've mentioned in previous lectures, he was my internist. So I did feel I got to know him a little bit in the way that patients get to know their doctors. But really through these lectures, I've come to appreciate in much deeper way what a wonderful paradigm he was for all of us of the right way to go about good doctoring and also a, a wonderful paradigm of the right way to go about living and his zest for life and his zest to ride his bicycle and do his marathons and be with his family and be with his colleagues and be a good friend and be a model for healthy, thoughtful living in a complicated time. And so we celebrate Carl Henry, I've learned to call him, and also are grateful once again to have his wife with us here today, Mary Beth Kelly, who you'll remember has worked tirelessly in the years since his passing to make life safer for New Yorkers, and in particular those who want to get around other, through, other than through motorized vehicles. And we've invited Mary Beth to come up and say a few words about her organization in that spirit. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure always to be here and um, to kind of do a, uh, an up-to-date on where we are with this uh, movement to make um, New York City and beyond uh, safe for walking, biking, and public transit. Um, <clears throat> I especially, especially want to thank the people who started this lecture 13 years ago when my husband died. Um, and in particular to uh, Carl and Norma Braun, um, Norma herself just last year being a, a victim of traffic violence right in front of St. Luke's Sinai Hospital. Um, and she's still in there now, <laughs> rehabilitated and back to work. Amazing. Um, so almost six years ago, Families for Safe Streets was formed when a group of people like myself who had lost a loved one or had been severely injured in traffic uh, crashes here in New York City came together um, to say, you know, we can use our voices and tell our stories to maybe help make a difference. Since then, we've raised awareness, we've um, brought down the speed limit, we passed new laws, it required marches and lobbying, uh, elected officials, networking, die-ins, and even civil disobedience, which landed some of us in jail for a night last year. But the result of that was winning 170 was was winning speed cameras for every school zone in New York City. Um, automated uh, traffic law enforcement is one of the um, major ways uh, to bring down deaths on the streets of New York. <clears throat> But because our streets remain deadly, despite this, I wish to share the following excerpts taken from our recent presentation to the New York State Commissioner of Public Health, <clears throat> Dr. Howard Zucker. On New York City streets and nationwide, we have a frightening and significant rise in pedestrian and cyclist fatalities. This is what we do when we tell our stories. We show our pictures. It's effective. We have a significant rise in pedestrian cyclist fatalities. So far in 2019, we've seen a 170% increase in cyclist fatalities, a 15% interest in pedestrian fatalities, and an 8% increase in the average number of people killed in each crash. On average, the city, one New Yorker is killed every 40 hours. Most people don't know this. Each year, over 250 hundred New Yorkers sustain life-altering injuries. Statewide, the numbers are equally shocking, averaging 1,000 people killed a year and over 60,000 injured. These aren't just numbers, but someone's beloved, a son, a daughter, 
a grandmother, a two-year-old, a teacher, and yes, even your doctor. These crashes are too frequent, too predictable, too deadly, but they are preventable. We have the antivirus, and while we need attitudes and change of behaviors, more importantly, this epidemic, and likely any other, requires cultural and systemic change. Some ingredients of that antivirus <clears throat> are street redesign, car-free zones, lower speed limits, and enforcement cameras. But we lack the political will to make these changes that's required. And we do live in a car culture and people are very attached to their cars and their parking spots. I'm sure as you have read over the past couple of years as we struggle to get uh, things like the bike lane um, and the street redesign and the pedestrian plazas that you now know um, are here and up on Amsterdam Avenue, First Avenue, Second Avenue, etc. New York's health code states that a public health emergency occurs when, quote, urgent public health action is necessary to protect the public health against imminent or existing threat. The number of people injured and killed on our streets more than justifies declaring a public health emergency for our city and our state. Beyond the immeasurable human costs, the economic impact is vast. Our city spends $4.29 billion in medical and legal expenses, as well as in lost work. So we need you. We need the healthcare community making your voices heard alongside ours. St. Luke's Trauma Program Director Deborah Travis sees the carnage almost daily and has been indispensable in our fight and other physicians throughout the city, particularly, as you can imagine, trauma surgeons. They see it all. So what we want you is for you to join us and press our public health departments and our commissioners to declare a public health emergency and commit the resources to eliminate this epidem epidemic hiding in plain sight. I watched helpless as my partner of 35 years was cut down in the most violent of manner. I know the wreckage, the sadness, the impact to a family and a community. In the name of Dr. Carl Henry, not you've gathered here today to learn. I ask that you also take action. Please discuss this crucial issue with your colleagues. Reach out to us to get involved. I have no doubt that he would have. He always did. You'll find brochures on the back table about us. Your social work departments have all been equipped with these. If you have a uh, a patient um, or you know a family member that has lost someone, please let them know about us. We provide peer support, we provide monthly community, various kinds of support programs, and for those interested, we provide training in how to become an advocate. And in that advocacy, people experience tremendous sense of, of community and support in something that 13 years ago, nothing like that existed for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, really much appreciated, and thank you so much. I'm so sorry I have to run. I have a Vision Zero Cities conference up at the Columbia Law School that we're Columbia. Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great to have you here, and it's really in the spirit of of Mary Beth and Carl's memory and her organization that we're so delighted to have Alvin Hal Strelnick with us today, who. For us in primary care, I mean, he's really a giant in primary care over the last many decades. Dr. Strelnick, I, I usually try to memorize people's titles, but you have so many, I had to write them down. So he's Professor of Family and Social Medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Associate Dean for Community Engagement. He is the Director of the Hispanic Center of Excellence at Bronx Hope. Also, uh, he's director of the core for community engagement for the Einstein Montefiore Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. And he is the chief of division 
of, of the Division of Community Health of Department of Family and Social Medicine at Montefiore. Dr. Skolnick received his bachelor's degree from Princeton and his medical degree from Yale Medical School and then completed his residency and chief residency in a version of what he's going to be sharing with us today, which is the social medicine program in family medicine residency at Montefiore. As a teacher, as a researcher, as a clinician, as an activist, he's brought to life what we all strive for, which is community-oriented primary care. And he's done this in some of the most challenging corners of the Bronx with people with intellectual disabilities, people struggling with HIV early in that epidemic, people who are homeless, people who are struggling through economic disparities in the healthcare system. And Dr. Skolnick, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you with us, and we are all so deeply admiring of your work, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that very generous um, introduction, and if it were possible to trade all those titles for Henry to be sitting in one of these seats, um, uh, that would happen in a nanosecond. Um, I realized uh, this morning, this is the first time I've been at Roosevelt, uh, now Mansanai West, um, since I came to visit uh, Henry after his accident, um, when he was in your intensive care unit. And uh, um, inadvertently, Mary Beth uh, advanced the slides to his page in this presentation, and uh, with uh, with pictures of he and his kids when they were traveling in Holland, which was something that I did with my stepchildren and my wife uh, from uh, in 2009. And I um, uh, just completed with my wife a 180-mile uh, uh, bike trip along the, the Erie Canal from Syracuse to Albany, which was uh, an hour now I'm going to have to go from Buffalo to Syracuse. Um, at any rate, the, uh, I think the, the point that Dr. Sewell made was uh, uh, one that remembering uh, Henry was uh, as he was the, the physician who I referred all of the patients who came to the Bronx, who lived in Manhattan, who wanted a physician in Manhattan, um, that I referred them to, and uh, and I was always impressed at how um, how much feedback I got about what a great physician they uh, I had found for them. Uh, and I also wanted just to acknowledge uh, Fernando Carnavali, who's a graduate of this program uh, in internal medicine, as I was in uh, family medicine. And let's. See if we can um, move this to the videotape because I think that, that would be the next. So, just this is a four minute video about the program. Uh, last year, we won an award from the Josiah Macy Foundation. I'm proud to welcome you to. feeling that people are willing to dedicate their life's work to the health 
and well-being of patients and families in the Bronx and can work not just locally with the Bronx but globally to try to reduce and eliminate healthcare disparities and promote social change and social justice. We are the Department of Family and Social Medicine, which is an academic department within Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We are also a clinical department within Montefiore Medical Center. We have an academic office here on Toronto Avenue, which is very close to the main We have two So I think the, uh, the message uh, is that the mission of this organization is for uh, identifying and taking care of the problems of individuals, families, and the communities. And the uh, remainder of the talk will be about how we try to do that and how that has been shaped by the Bronx. And I'm curious how many of you have been to the Bronx? And uh, good, so I don't have to tell you too much about it, um, but it, because I think it's uh, very much what shaped the organization, which will be 50 years old in uh, next year, in 2020. Uh, it was founded in 19, 1970. So here's the aerial view most people get for the Bronx where they are landing in uh, at LaGuardia Airport and uh, get the, uh, the flyover just like the flyover in the, the rest of the country. Um, and you can see that, uh, that Montefiore Medical Center um, the main center is, uh, uh, and like Mount Sinai, um, Montefiore has grown and is now a $8 billion corporation with uh, sites in uh, the Bronx and Westchester County and uh, uh, up the Hudson Valley. Uh, the uh, Jerome Park Reservoir is where some of the drinking water for the city is kept. Um, Probably many of you know the botanical gardens and the, the 
uh, Bronx Zoo, uh, as well as uh, the division between Manhattan and the Bronx created by the, the Harlem River, which uh, tracks along here and, see if, um, and divides what is really a, a, a ecological region um, of the, and the, the poorest uh, congressional district in the United States. Uh, this is the famous George Washington Bridge, which uh, um, uh, Governor Christie made famous um, for those people who haven't been exposed to it um, with the, uh, the so-called bridge gate. And uh, Rikers Island here, which is the prison complex for the city of New York. Uh, Hunts Point is where most of the fresh food, meat, and fish arrive each uh, morning at two or three in the morning uh, and is distributed throughout the region and throughout the city um, uh, th at the Hunts Point um, market. Um, this is the map with the uh, Bronx highlighted, and uh, this is looking at the percentage of uninsured, and you can see that much of the South Bronx uh, is affected by uh, the those who are uh, uh, insured or uninsured and have the highest rates with the, the lightest color being the, the lowest rates of uh, on insurance. Just as I uh, as I got to say in the, the video, um, the uh, borough is a, a, a is 1.5 million people, the majority of whom are Latino. Um, it's I try to remind people that 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 makes it uh, two and a half times the size of Boston, um, and that. Uh, it's smaller than uh, in population than Brooklyn, uh, Queens, and Manhattan, which are uh, so. It's really the, the the fourth of the five boroughs in population, um, but it's certainly the fifth of the five boroughs in political influence and wealth. Um, the it is a very high in uh, percentage of those born elsewhere, and most of the births that occur in the Bronx are to women who were born outside of the borders of the United States. And uh, you can see the list of countries, including the Dominican Republic, uh, Jamaica, and other parts of the Caribbean, Mexico, Ecuador, Guyana, Ghana, Honduras, Italy, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Bangladesh, in that order, um, with Gambia and Nigeria just falling behind. So um, it is not as diverse as Queens, um, which is the most diverse county in America, and Harris County, which is Houston, um, is trying to make the argument that it is the most uh, diverse county. Uh, and one of my Princeton professors who has been at Rice and runs an institute there is the main person making that argument, uh, Stephen Kleinberg. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, not only is the borough district, but the entire county. Uh, uh, the Bronx is the poorest urban county in the United States. There are only there are three rural um, uh, counties, uh, two in Alabama and one in uh, South Dakota, which is an Indian reservation um, that are poor. And it is uh, has uh, the highest rate of single parent households um, of the major cities in the in in the country uh, much of the history and this is the way the bronx uh, looked when i arrived uh, in 1975 um, and the, this was the history of uh, three decades um, the borough bounced back in uh, starting in the 1990s and has um, uh, returned with the uh, uh, both the economic development as well as cultural. This uh, this is this building is the Bronx Museum of the Arts, uh, and there's the uh, in the last Sunday Arts section there was a full um, 
full page story about uh, an exhibit going on there about uh, graffiti by Henry Schellefant, um, who uh, photographed the, the trains uh, of the subway uh, with the, art, the spontaneous art that was created by the, the graffiti artists, and then new housing. I used to get I used to give tours of the Bronx um, to our residents uh, during our orientation month each year, and it got increasingly more difficult to find abandoned buildings. Um, one of the major reasons people go to the Bronx is to see the Yankees. Um, there is the old and the new stadium, um, the Botanical Gardens, which is really uh, the Botanical Gardens is, has a major research institute. It's an international uh, research organization, as well as being a site uh, and running the, the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens and the, and, uh, and the zoo that is in Manhattan, which is run by the Wildlife uh, Conservation Society. So the Bronx has major, major um, uh, national and uh, international organizations. So focusing on the residency program in social medicine, um, the, it, this quote is of it being situated on the San Andreas fault uh, between medicine and public health characterized by the tensions and covert hostilities and at, at times open warfare. It's not always been a popular program. Um, this was our logo for a brief generation and these are the 12 um, community districts in the Bronx. And this is where we are located. Um, the uh, residency program in, um, in social medicine is actually four residencies that work together. Uh, general internal medicine, general pediatrics, family medicine, and uh, preventive medicine. Uh, these are our physical sites, um, the pediatrics and internal medicine are uh, practice at the Comprehensive Family Health Center, which is on 161st Street in the South Bronx. In the North Bronx, uh, the two family health centers, uh, the sixth floor of this uh, building that looks like a wedding cake um, on Fordham Road, uh, right across the street from the Fordham University campus. Um, this is a historical timeline, um, beginning with the establishment of the Dr. Martin Luther King Health Center, which is was one of the very first uh, federally qualified or federally funded uh, community health centers. Uh, the creation, and this occurred in 1968, uh, Montefiore created, uh, <coughs> recruited a um, Canadian physician who had been involved in the strike in Saskatchewan that led to the uh, Canadian uh, national uh, medical system, which it's known as Medicare. Uh, Harold Wise, uh, when they had difficulty finding and recruiting physicians um, that fit with the team uh, approach to care, um, they decided, uh, with the help of David Kindig, who was a chief resident in pediatrics at the time, that they'd start their own program. It was the 60s, and that was what you did in the 60s. If you didn't, couldn't find what you needed, you started something new. Um, so two tracks were started in 1970, pediatrics and internal medicine. 1973, family medicine was added. Um, the, we've moved around from, uh, we're no longer affiliated with the, uh, the Martin Luther King Health Center, which is part of the uh, Bronx, uh, Lebanon, uh, Bronx care, healthcare system. Um, We've moved now into three different uh, federally qualified health centers, all of which are affiliated with the Montefiore system, um, which I showed pictures of. And we've also developed uh, an inpatient service, a palliative care service, a wound care service, a healing arts program, um, and most recently the preventive medicine uh, residency program, um, which started uh, Three years ago, and we've had we have two graduates of that program, and one starting uh, this coming year. Um, over since 1970, we've graduated 
861 graduates, um, a majority of them, or a plurality of them in family medicine, um, about a third in internal medicine, and about a fourth in uh, pediatrics. One of the uh, interesting patterns that we have seen for a very long time is that a mission-driven organization like our own um, has tended to attract women more than men uh, and whose values align uh, and uh, our program, uh, unlike most of medicine, which is now about 50-50, um, uh, has been a majority of women uh, in all of our programs. And the leadership of our uh, programs, um, our family medicine, uh, we've had uh, four women uh, residency directors since the beginning. And uh, uh, one of these days we might have a man, but the chair is uh, a man. Uh, about half of our graduates are people of color and about and half are white. Uh, uh, that's by intention and by uh, the focus on recruiting people with the commitments to serve the underserved. And that that is... Uh, the uh, essential part of this, uh, and you'll see uh, in a few moments about our efforts to try to look at whether our graduates are different when they arrive and therefore stay that way or that the actual training uh, bends the curve and uh, affects what people are doing. And so uh, we did uh, a study uh, and took five years of our internal medicine uh, applicants uh, and divided them up by those who ranked us and they and joined us with those who uh, went elsewhere. Uh, obviously, this is embedded uh, with a lot of uh, selection bias, both on the part of our faculty uh, and residents who were selecting the residents uh, uh, that were coming and ranking them, uh, but it also was something that the, the residents themselves but the applicants themselves were making uh, choices to go uh, where they went. And uh, we found that there were significant differences, uh, not only in the level of interest that, the, that we measured when we looked five years after the, the program. So this would be a quasi-experimental design, uh, and there were significant, uh, almost significant differences in how interested people were in primary care. Um, and whether they were trained in the inner city, whether they were trained in a community health center, uh, what the faculty values were. Um, did they favor salary practice versus private practice? Did they favor uh, uh, service in underserved areas or uh, uh, did they promote um, more specialty care in what, um, how they were trained? Uh, and then an estimate of what their practice looked like, estimate of uh, whether or not they practiced in a medically underserved area, MUA, or uh, health professions shortage area, an uh, HPSA. And there were significant differences. Uh, similarly, the, the, we asked about the content of the curriculum that our applicants, now, so this is a, a selection of people that actually came and interviewed at our program um, and the comparison of what they actually had in their own training um, uh, demonstrated that there was a significant difference in how much community medicine, psychosocial uh, emphasis, epidemiology, whether they had community orientations, uh, a community project, or um, they were trained in how the health system uh, works, what health policy is, how things get paid for, uh, and in all those cases, uh, and I, the, uh, the the triple asterisk is uh, less than 0. 0.0001. Um, ultimately, the practice was not quite as different as uh, we might have expected. Um, there was not significant difference in practicing in inner cities or community health centers. Um, but there was differences in practicing in HMOs and the uh, actual practice of primary care and in uh, M, uh, MUAs and uh, health professionals, shortage area 
approach significance with this relatively small sample. Uh, and when we did a more sophisticated uh, uh, regression analysis, we were able to demonstrate that uh, there was a significant difference when you looked at uh, primary care and, uh, and MUAs uh, together. Um, our current um, C COO, who is about to become the CEO, is a graduate of our program. Our current, Montefiore's current uh, CEO, uh, Dr. Steve Safier, is a graduate of our internal medicine program. Um, and one of the things that uh, I almost fell off my chair when I opened the annual report two years ago of the Montefiore Medical Center, and in the first sentence is a discussion of social justice. Um, that's not where I would expect uh, that to appear, but that has been adopted by the larger healthcare system, and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the efforts of Montefiore to expand into the uh, Westchester and suburban areas uh, initially was following the money, and uh, the institution failed when it started working with the. Uh, the, the Medicaid reform program and working with low-income people, um, it succeeded because that's what it knew how to do. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of the growth has been understanding and uh, working with uh, Medicaid populations and working with the, the larger system uh, in the Hudson Valley uh, around that. In pediatrics, um, our, uh, Dr. Philip Oswa, who was the current Chief Operating Officer and is the heir apparent uh, to succeed. Uh, Dr. Safir is a not only a graduate of our um, pediatrics program, he was the chief resident and he was the director of our social pediatrics program before he became the chair uh, of uh, pediatrics and then the, uh, his current position. Um, he, his, this is work from his, um, his PhD thesis uh, where he did a much uh, longer term follow up of uh, graduates over more than a 30 year period uh, and looked at the uh, percentage of the graduates in uh, pediatrics who had practiced in underserved areas, in community health centers, in health professional areas, uh, in federally qualified health centers, and in uh, primary care practice. And you can see these percentages of both past practice and current practice are very high. Um, there was no comparison group in, in, uh, uh, in Dr. Oswald's thesis, which uh, uh, I was able to help uh, him arrange with the University of Nebraska, which had an off-site PhD program in, in health policy. Um, but nonetheless, this is, these were uh, fulfilling the goals uh, and the mission of the, or, of the efforts to provide care for the underserved. Uh, here is, uh, this is a, a faculty member, and these are two residents in the precepting office. Uh, more pictures of our residents. This is at happy times when they are graduating. You can, uh, this is um, Sandra Baganza, who's uh, the director of social pediatrics uh, as we speak. Um, And uh, of course, there's a required Yankees game. Uh, um, I, I have to confess that uh, I grew up in Milwaukee and uh, got to see two World Series games because they had built Milwaukee County Stadium on the vet Veterans Administration's uh, grounds. And my father worked for the Veterans Administration as a physical therapist. And uh, uh, both times in the 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 Milwaukee, the then Milwaukee Braves, um, lost to the to the uh, Yankees. Um, one year they won the series. One year the Yankees won the series. Um, it's very difficult for me to go into Yankee Stadium uh, from that and from what the Yankees did to the Bronx by uh, relocating their uh, stadium onto a, a public park, uh, which took ten years to replace. Um, the residency program has uh, 
uh, other outcomes besides its individual graduates, it's uh, as um, as Ileana Corin in the video mentioned, the behavioral sciences uh, in uh, have been recognized. Uh, the organization has won awards from the Society of uh, Teachers of Family Medicine. It won the uh, Primary Care Achievement Award uh, from the Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, and I got a trip to Aspen to go and accept that award. Um, uh, and that uh, and then a, a trip to Atlanta um, to accept the award from the Macy Foundation. Um, one of the other aspects of uh, which uh, Dr. Sewell had men mentioned is uh, that our, a lot of our uh, graduates uh, do specialize, but they tend to specialize in populations uh, rather than uh, organic uh, organ specialties. Uh, so school and adolescent health is one area, geriatrics is another, occupational environmental health uh, is another, and now that you have a closer f affiliation with uh, uh, Mount Sinai, that that's uh, a major uh, cluster of our graduates work at Mount Sinai and the occupational health program. Um, in addition, the, the, uh, the Bronx was the uh, epicenter of the uh, AIDS and HIV epidemic among people of color, um, that uh, there was uh, at least a lot of the internal, uh, the infectious disease specialists were not particularly interested. So a lot of generalists um, became experts in HIV at that time uh, and uh, continue in that way. And uh, a lot of the expertise in HIV care is in primary care and is dispersed throughout our uh, ambulatory and uh, primary care practices. A lot of interest and activity in addiction disorders, which of course is the current epidemic. Um, and uh, integration of primary uh, adult care in uh, substance abuse and addiction care has been a major initiative, which has uh, uh, been led by uh, internists that have graduated from the social medicine program and are continuing to do that work um, going forward. Uh, Dr. Sewell also mentioned the uh, caring for adults with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, working in prisons. That's uh, Dr. Safier's uh, uh, preparation for running Montefiore Medical Center was running the health services at uh, Rikers Island. Uh, and uh, that uh, prepared him to become the uh, chief medical officer under the previous president and CEO and eventually to take over the entire system. Uh, we, we were providing homeless care um, back in the 80s and uh, helped launch that. Um, and I, I can remember that in the morning, the uh, care for the homeless group was in the court fighting the city to try to provide better services and in the afternoon writing a grant because the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation insisted that uh, that there only be one grant from each city that was eligible for their homeless program. And uh, we managed to do that and the, the current commissioner was the one in the court and uh, helping us write that grant. And of course, uh, I highlighted the Bronx as a immigrant community. It's been an immigrant a community for generations uh, and continues to do that. And then uh, bringing this back to what Mary, uh, what, uh, what Mary Beth said uh, uh, about advocacy that, uh, and this is the definition of what we do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be health. That's the, de the de definition the Institute of Medicine uses for public health, and part of our training is to try to help in advocating for systems change. So I'll go through the sort of major uh, areas that we have been uh, different um, and which we have uh, focused on and which I think contribute to the differences in outcomes and the, uh, the, the capacity that our graduates have had for leadership. Um, it's very much 
mission oriented and we do that with recruitment uh, and selection uh, and the desire to give the residents as much uh, of self-management as, as possible. Uh, we, the selection processes involve patients and staff from our health centers um, for most of the years that we've been doing this. We collaborate among the, the, the four primary care uh, disciplines and uh, have developed uh, partnerships uh, where people practice together, even as residents, uh, sharing a call or, and sharing a practice at the health center. Um, having a practice at the health center makes a big difference, uh, and that's been part of our roots. And really, our origin was to was a health center leadership created us, and we uh, have tried to uh, fulfill that. And we've not always been as tied and connected to health centers as we have, but we try to do that. We try to focus on the biopsychosocial, or what is often considered the ecological um, family systems approach, uh, and have highlighted that in our uh, uh, recruitment brochure. Um, we insist that uh, we try to practice social medicine, and that involves uh, a core curriculum. All of our graduates are required to, to do a social medicine project. Um, we have a month-long immersion orientation, um, not just to the Bronx, but to the health centers. And the, the residents do a collective project uh, together um, in, with that month of time uh, that they're freed up from their hospital uh, obligations. Uh, we've also supported the use of an uh, understanding uh, of complementary and alternative therapies, uh, and certainly um, uh, providing uh, palliative care within the hospital, the health centers, and at home. And we've tried to get public support through the federal Title VII programs for uh, our residency. And by and large, what we have tried to do is to infuse and integrate public health into the ongoing practice. Uh, this is what the, the uh, curriculum looks like when it's divided up over the three years of training. We've had medical Spanish. The 25-year the, the uh, watch I got from Montefiore, I gave to the Spanish teacher who for, 20, for as long as I've been there has been teaching Spanish in August to our residents uh, that need this. Um, uh, we also, in the, later in the fall, have an orientation uh, which involves working and meeting with groups around the borough uh, and learning about what the major issues are and those issues uh, you know, change from year to year and uh, where people want to put their energy uh, also changes. Uh, we have the, uh, a core course in evidence-based medicine which uh, is also you know, crit critical appraisal uh, and we also have a core course in understanding the health system and all of its uh, dysfunctions. Uh, I have spent a lot, my, a much of my time of the last decade trying to explain what's in the Affordable Care Act that you never read about in the newspaper um, because it's, the, the focus has only been on a, uh, a very small portion of the Affordable Care Act that, um, that went into effect in, uh, in 2010. Uh, we try to uh, have longitudinal experiences for all of our residents have their own practices uh, that are integrated in the, the, uh, the, the health centers. Uh, and uh, we try to have rounds like this, just as you do, uh, only perhaps our focus is a little, a, a little different. Uh, the, similarly, the, there's a, a plan over the three years for residents in all of their training with our behavioral science faculty, which is shared among the three uh, clinical programs. Um, and uh, this is the model we think about uh, as the, as uh, for our immersion and orientation program, uh, including the community, uh, the development of the, the individual physician. The focus is not to, to, 
to create something that we've already seen, but rather to help each individual resident become the best physician that they want to be and to try to help assure that, uh, recognizing that uh, they, everyone brings a different experience uh, and a different level of, of exposure uh, and different expertise to the program when they arrive uh, after medical school graduation. Uh, I'm going to just try to wrap this up so we have some questions. Uh, a lot of this is done through partnerships, not only individual residents working together, but uh, the medical and medical system, the, the medical school, and the residency program working with community-based organizations and understanding that we've been uh, lucky to be able to be in the right place at the right time. We helped start the first Buddhist temple in the Bronx, uh, with, working with the uh, relocated uh, Cambodian community, the Khmer, uh, who had been resettled in the Bronx uh, after the, the, the Vietnam War ended. Uh, and now there are clusters uh, that have uh, grown up alongside our, our, our practices uh, that we work with, as well as the higher education and, uh, and the school health program. The, the longest line in the Bronx is the principals lining up to have a Montefiore school health program in their building. Uh, at, uh, and we're now at the largest school health program in the, in the country, uh, and the line is not much shorter. Um, I think we're at uh, in the 30s um, uh, of individual school-based uh, uh, programs. And our health center networks, uh, uh, Morris Heights Health Center and Urban Health Plan, which are independent, uh, but in the Bronx, uh, have comparable programs, though smaller. Uh, and uh, this is just a summary. Um, the focus is uh, on the mission and people that embrace the mission. That uh, mission is integrating the individual and population health and trying to uh, make medicine and the practice of medicine an instrument of social justice. So I'll stop there. Um, I don't know how many, if we have time for questions or. Second. Okay, thanks. Okay, now you're good. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Having spent my entire medical education and career in New York City, I hear this uh, very clearly. <laughs> I, I started out at Bellevue. But at any rate, uh, what I was curious about is uh, you have 50 years, and what is the data on the actual impact in the population you serve? Uh, whatever parameters you measure, uh, hospital admissions, readmissions, mortality rates, morbidity, and so on, what is the impact there? The other is, uh, and I struggle with this a lot, is how to apply evidence-based medicine to a population who doesn't at all reflect the population studied when the evidence was being gathered. How do Two easy questions. <laughs> so, uh, we have been, uh, the, the city of New York under the Bloomberg administration was tracking uh, very actively the um, longevity of the population based on county. And there's been research going on uh, about the, the curve. And while the Bronx is um, the poorest and has the poorest um, uh, life expectancy of the five boroughs. It has been following a pattern with of increasing life expectancy, and it has uh, in twenty. 12 or 20, 2012 or 2014, it passed the national median. 
And some of that has been attributed to the in-migration of immigrants who in general as a group uh, are healthier and live longer, but it's also the, that the borough of the Bronx has the most community health center primary care based sites and the larger evidence uh, is that both uh, that primary care uh, practitioners and uh, federally qualified health centers, which we have been part of, we're not the whole story, but uh, it's a big borough and a big county, um, that comparable cities that uh, with, with less poverty have poor outcomes. Um, I've been working on trying to put that data together in something that would be respectable enough um, uh, and as a larger effort of the uh, sort of common effort in the Bronx to provide better and more uh, primary care. Um, I can't say that, um, that it is as health um, services related as it would be because the Bronx remains the 62nd county in New York State when the Robert Wood Johnson and the University of Wisconsin Population Institute look at the health outcomes and health factors and ranks the counties that were still last in the, in the state of New York. And, but if you compare us to other cities, and I think of particularly Baltimore, we are, uh, our uh, life expectancy is better and we have been catching up with Staten Island, which is uh, a, uh, a different kind of borough than the other four boroughs. Um, uh, that is a long uh, kind of try to uh, trying to answer that, particularly since uh, we've looked, I think our graduates are in 30 uh, or 32 different states in the union. Uh, I think Texas and California uh, have a lot of our graduates as well as the, as New York and New Jersey um, and Connecticut. Um, so I can't, uh, uh, now the, the second question, if it could be restated, I could try answering. Uh, how do you deal with the fact that a lot of the research that's brought to bear doesn't reflect the populations that we serve? So the, 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 when we talk about, um, when we talk about evidence-based medicine, we call it social medicine. Um, understanding the, the biases that are built into the literature, um, the misapplication of, uh, of the literature, the lack of recognition about, uh, in this country, particularly around social class and economics, um, less so about uh, race, ethnicity, and, uh, and gender. But those are part of what we train our residents to how to read the literature and how to interpret uh, the data, as well as trying to develop um, uh, investigators that are going to try to do research on these issues. And we have a division in our department, division research, and focuses on that, and, and in fact, our uh, the director of our division of research was just recruited to be the chair of uh, a family medicine at the University of Massachusetts. So we're looking for replacements. Um, it's part of the, uh, and some of that research is helping uh, the Bangladeshi community develop its own institutions to be able to take care of its own health problems. Um, and given the culture that they bring, that's, that's uh, particularly important as, uh, as a Muslim uh, uh, culture where men and women don't uh, interact in public. Thank you very much. I just uh, I don't have a question. But uh, what I do have is just to share with the group of comment. I just took a picture of one slides um, which uh, was the one about other important outcomes. We have six bullets of the special populations. I train in the area and I serve 50% of the bullets are under my doubt HIV for more than 20 
years adults with disabilities, and people in the wheelchair with identified drugs in the city. Um, I walk with you and the group in the first week that took us to walk the Bronx. Um, and for many of us that we know grew up here, I mean, it was just the first introduction to the population that we were serving. Um, the partnership um, was unique. I'm proud of that because we didn't have enough intensive care units, but how ahead of time uh, you and the program were. So, not for a question, but for a thank you now that I'd like to have the microphone just to tell everybody how wonderful the program is. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I learned um, is I did the, uh, the tours and uh, the walking tours and the bus tours and the meetings with uh, community-based groups and discovered some of the, our residents grew up in the Bronx. And I was introducing them to other neighborhoods in the Bronx that they had never been to. And that's true of many New Yorkers who, you know, you have a small, you know, you have where you work, you have where you live. Um, but a lot of your neighboring, the neighborhoods a mile away or three miles away, um, you know, you're never exposed to. So I was actually introducing native born, Bronx raised uh, physicians to neighborhoods in the Bronx, which they had never been to. And, um, and I had the, 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 one of our community health workers who was a family health worker, who uh, she wasn't born in the Bronx, but she was born in East Harlem, but grew up and lived in the Bronx. And so I helped her celebrate her 80th birthday um, a year ago. Uh, and she still sends out daily emails about uh, what's going on in the Bronx and how to try to do this. I, I will say, and this is um, uh, something that uh, we've discovered that there is a different culture in the Bronx, particularly in in the in competing organizations like health systems and hospitals of working together, um, because we have to, we have no choice. We don't have the political power. We don't have the wealth that uh, Manhattan or Brooklyn. We have our first mayor in my my time in New York um, that isn't uh, a, a resident of Manhattan and. Uh, sort of rooted in Manhattan, um, the collaborations have led to the creation of organizations um, that serve all of the borough and all of the health providers. Um, uh, and, and our organization has been part of that leadership because you learn uh, that the partnership works and that it, uh, and it takes, it's not easy um, and it's not in the, the medical school curriculum, but it's uh, uh, really important and has contributed to the, uh, the, the growth of some of the managed care organizations. Uh, the Medicaid managed care organizations grew out of our health centers and the facilitation that was provided from the leadership in our department um, for that to happen and, and similarly for the creation of something called the Bronx Health Link, which is the only borough which has a all of the healthcare providers joined together to try to advocate on behalf of the Bronx and provide the services that uh, that the, the borough is needed. And that's and part of my role as a dean is to to, to re represent the medical school uh, on the board of that uh, that organization and uh, uh, trying to get. It, it takes. You know, we're still trying to convince the uh, the politicians that, that that that's something that they should support uh, and uh, and make sure that it has the resources that it needs. Just one quick question: um, you haven't mentioned obesity, but I think you've done a fair amount of work in that realm as well. I just was curious about current efforts to address that part of. Challenges that exist in the Bronx and elsewhere. So, a lot of there's been a lot of efforts and some successful about uh, uh, changing the the, the uh, what's served in the public schools, um, moving from uh, whole milk to two percent, and uh, and 
alternatives like um, there are more individualized program. There's a program that uh, Jessica uh, Reeder, who's a pediatrician, runs called Be and Fit, which is focused on adolescents who are, are obese and helping them have uh, very active social and uh, physical lives. Um, once that has failed, there's been efforts working with the bodegas to provide more options, less uh, sugary drinks, uh, working in collaboration with some of the efforts that's gone on the, the health department. Um, and there's something called Bronx Reach, which is a CDC funded program, which the Institute for Family Health, which is affiliated with your organization, um, uh, has been leading for uh, a decade. So there's there, um, we have the highest rate of obesity, we have the highest rate of di uh, type two diabetes, um, and, uh, and, uh, and of course that's related both uh, to racial and eth ethnic groups, but mostly to poverty. And we've got plenty of that. Thank you so much. Thank you.